So here's the first part of homework 8-2. Uh, we'll start off with question 1. If we double the frequency of a system undergoing simple harmonic motion, which of the following statements about the system are true? Could be more than one correct choice, and actually for this question there will be more than one. Uh, there will actually be two answers. So if we look at this, the period is doubled. Well, the key relationship there is the relationship between frequency and period is frequency equals 1 over the period or vice versa. Right, period equals one of the frequency. So if I double the frequency, if I bring in a, a factor of two here, if I were to double the frequency, then I'm really cutting the period in half. Okay, so if I double the frequency, I'm cutting the, the period in half. So the period doesn't double, but if I do look through option D, the period is reduced to one half of what it was. That is one of my correct answers. And then the other ones here may be a little bit trickier to find. So the amplitude is doubled. One of the concepts we've talked about is the amplitude does not relate at all to the frequency or period. We've seen that a few times throughout various formats, but the amplitude isn't going to impact the, the period or the frequency. And then it comes down to the angular frequency. Well, the angular frequency is really going to do whatever the frequency of the system does. Because if I'm thinking about a spring, if a spring takes a certain amount of time to go out and back before it comes back to where it started, the, the circular motion that represents that, so if I've got a, a point moving around in a circle, this circular motion needs to take the same amount of time to complete that cycle. So I know that taking the time is referencing the period, but frequency is also related to that. So if all of a sudden I double the frequency, if I double how many cycles happen over here, I'm also doubling how many cycles have to happen over here. So whatever the linear frequency does, the angular frequency would also do the same thing. So our correct options on this one are B and D. The angular frequency double and the period is cut in one half. Question two on this homework is a lot like one we've seen before, however it does represent velocity versus time as opposed to position versus time. But they do ask us to translate the velocity versus time graph to an acceleration versus time graph. We do it the same way we would with our position to our velocity graph. So when we had a position versus time and we want to translate it to a velocity versus time as we did in the first homework, we do the same type of thing here. The acceleration is the slope of my velocity versus time graph. So if I start off right away, I'm starting with a positive slope, and that tells me I need to be starting with a positive acceleration. So I start with a positive slope, and then I have a slope of zero, then I have a negative slope, then I have a slope of zero. So if I'm looking through my graphs, really if I just focus on one or two of those points, I can narrow this down pretty quickly. Graph A doesn't work because it's starting at zero, and we need it to start at a positive number. Graph C doesn't work because it's starting at a negative quantity and we need to start at a positive number. And graph D doesn't work because it's starting at zero again. So even though it's going up, it's not starting at a positive value. So B is the only graph that starts up here at a positive value. After a certain amount of time, it's down to equilibrium. It's down to zero. I shouldn't necessarily say equilibrium, but it's down to an acceleration of zero. And then down at the bottom is where it's a negative slope. So down here, that's where my acceleration would be negative, consistent with that one. So option B is the graph that coincides with our, our given graph for question two. Question three says in simple harmonic motion, when is the magnitude of the acceleration the greatest? We've again seen a question like this a couple times before. This is just asking us to relate multiple factors of our, of our periodic motion together. It does say there are multiple correct choices, and in fact for this one we're going to have three correct choices. Okay, so we're going to be actually looking to find three of these choices that are right. So when the speed is the maximum, well, we know when the speed is the maximum, that's when our kinetic energy is at its maximum. And when the kinetic energy is at its maximum, the potential energy is zero. That's important because the potential energy is zero when my displacement is zero. And when my displacement is zero, my acceleration is zero, not the greatest. So when the speed is at its maximum, we're not accelerating as much anymore because it's, it's going to be working against us soon enough. Okay, so kind of that transition there. For the first one, we can rule that first one out. Again, when the displacement is zero, same rationale I just used. When the kinetic energy is at its maximum, that's when the displacement is zero, but we don't want that scenario. We want a different one. Now, I've already told you there's three right answers, so we know it is going to be the next three, but let's look at exactly why. So when the magnitude of the displacement is at its maximum, well, when delta x is as big as possible, then my force, which is based on k times x, is going to be as big as possible. And when my force goes up, if force is mass times acceleration, my acceleration is slow. So the bigger the x is, the bigger my acceleration has to be. 
So at the maximum di displacement here, I do have to have a maximum acceleration. When the potential energy is at a maximum, potential energy is also based on x, right? One half and k never change for a given spring, but the x does. And so as x increases, my potential energy increases, and we already know as x increases, so does a. So when the potential energy goes up, my x goes up, and therefore my a goes up. So that's why that option works. And then finally, the kinetic energy is a minimum. Well, we want there to be as much potential energy as possible, and the way to get as much potential energy is to reduce the kinetic energy, right? So if my kinetic energy were zero, then my potential energy would represent the total energy of the graph, and that is, once again, going to be the highest value, causing me to have the highest x, causing me to have the highest acceleration. So there are three correct choices for option three. Option C, D, and E. Those all coincide with the greatest acceleration. Question four, another multiple choice, the total mechanical energy of a simple harmonic oscillating system. It does take us back, it's been a little while since we've talked about total mechanical energy. That term first popped up when we were talking about energies way back in chapter four or five. Total mechanical energy just really truly represents your total potential plus your total kinetic energy. So we're not worried about heat, we're not worried about any type of chemical energy, but we are worried about any type of potential energy or kinetic. The important thing for simple harmonic motion is we know that even as a spring oscillates, so even if I've got a, this is just a given situation, but if I've got a spring that's going to and from its most compressed to its most stretched position, the total energy of the system is going to be constant as long as there's no friction involved. And simple harmonic motion implies that there's no friction or no outside force involved. So the total energy of the system is going to be a constant measurement for us. And so it is going to be a constant. So reading through our options here, if we just look at option E, it is a non-zero constant. So it's not equal to zero, but it is equal to some constant. Okay, the rest of these are all slightly faulty. So the total energy is not zero when it passes through equilibrium. The potential energy would be zero when it passes through equilibrium, but it would have kinetic energy, right, once it's going through the middle. So its total energy is not zero. Same, kind of the alternate thinking when it's at the maximum displacement, right? All of the energy at that point would be potential. And then vice versa here, right? Maximum when it passes through the equilibrium. Well, it can't be maximum, again, its total energy is constant. It can't be a minimum because its total energy is constant. Okay, so make sure we're pretty comfortable with that concept. Energy can transfer to and from kinetic to potential, right? We can transfer between kinetic and potential energy, but we don't lose it and we don't create it. So the energy is constant the entire time. Question five says we've got an object hanging from a ceiling of a stationary elevator by an ideal spring. It oscillates with a period of t. If all of a sudden the elevator starts accelerating upward with two times Earth's gravity, what will the period of the oscillating object be? So we need to think about what's our period formula for a spring. Where does the period come from for a spring? Well, if we just jump in with this formula, if we can remember this equation, if you look through here, you need to think about what impact does doubling gravity have on any of these measurements, right? Well, doubling the acceleration due to gravity doesn't affect my mass, and it never affects my k. My k is a constant based on the spring, and 2 pi is also a constant, right? So just because I double the acceleration doesn't actually have any impact on the period for a spring. Now, it would cause the spring to stretch a little bit more, right? Because if I'm thinking in terms of forces, the force of the spring would equal the force of gravity, and so k times x would equal mass times my acceleration. Well, if I double my acceleration, then my distance would have to double as well. But again, in terms of the period, the amplitude of the motion doesn't impact the period. So no matter how far I've stretched this, right, it doesn't actually impact the period of my motion. Okay, so there's no immediate impact, so my period is still just t. This would also be different if I had said it was a pendulum, right? If this had been a pendulum instead of a spring, the pendulum does depend, as we can see, on the acceleration due to gravity. So if all of a sudden I was to double this number, it would cause my, my period to decrease by a certain factor, right? It would cause it to decrease by dividing by the square root 2. Okay, so that is something else to keep in mind, but for a spring, the acceleration due to gravity is independent of the period. Question 6 on homework 8.2 is actually maybe a little bit misleading. It says, a ball swinging at the end of a massless string undergoes simple harmonic motion. At what point or points is the magnitude of the instantaneous acceleration of the ball the greatest? 
And I think this question really would be better served if it said the instantaneous restoring acceleration rather than just acceleration because we know that at any given point on this pendulum the entire force due to gravity would be pulling straight down. So if I was thinking about the actual total acceleration due to gravity, the total acceleration would always be the same. So it would be it would be constant for each of those points. What this question is actually set up to intend is when is the acceleration that's going to restore it to equilibrium going to be the highest? When is the component of gravity that's pulling it towards the center of the, the motion here? When is that going to be at its highest? Okay, so if we're looking through because gravity always pulls straight down, so if I take, for instance, at point A, gravity's pulling straight down, part of that would be pulling, though, tangent to the curve. And the portion of the acceleration of gravity that pulls tangent to the curve is what's going to be causing it to accelerate back to its equilibrium position over here. So the further away we are from equilibrium, the higher that acceleration is going to be. Much like that of a, of a spring, the pendulum is always going to have a higher acceleration the further we are away. So at point A and point D, the acceleration is going to be an equal in magnitude, but it's going to be opposite in direction. So we are going to have an equal magnitude going that way and that way. So the correct answer on this one was intended to be option A and D. Again, truly this should have said maybe something more along the line of when is the restoring acceleration or when is the acceleration directed towards equilibrium at the greatest. Right? The total, the total acceleration would always be 9.8 or a gravity pulling straight down. But this question was intended to set up for part B there, or for, for option B. So the first of the free response questions from this homework, question 7, if your heart is beating 68 beats per minute, assuming there's no test, what is the frequency of your heart's oscillation in hertz? So we're just looking for frequency. This one's truly just a pretty simple understanding of what does it mean to be frequency, right? We need to know, we need to be very comfortable with the fact that frequency is cycles per second. If we're going for hertz, we're going for cycles per second. So by them giving us 68 beats per minute, they're telling us our heart pumps 68 times. So there's 68 complete cycles per minute, right? And per minute would be 60 seconds. So here I've got 68 cycles. Here I've got 60 seconds. And then it's a simple division between the two. So when I divide those two numbers, I get 1.13 hertz. And hertz comes from just 1 over seconds. So that's what gives me that unit for hertz. Okay, so like I said, pretty straightforward understanding of frequency. Definitely need to be able to represent frequency in terms of something like this, where we can interpret context and realize, hey, that's just how many cycles per second. Question 8 is like an example we've seen a few times in the uh, notes from this section. So a sewing machine needle moves up and down, simple harmonic motion. The amplitude they give us of 1.27. We do want our amplitude, however, in meters and not centimeters. So I'll go ahead and write that as 0 0.0127 meters. The frequency they give us as well. 2.55 hertz, not a very good 5, but it works. Okay, so what are the maximum speed and the maximum acceleration? Part A is maybe the trickiest part that it takes a little getting used to. This, if you do go back and look through kind of our derivation for the period formula though, the first conclusion we had to make was the maximum speed, the maximum velocity, equals my circumference over my period. So I'm taking my circumference of the circle that represents this motion, 2 pi times the amplitude, since the amplitude would act as my radius, and then my period of the motion. So looking through, the good news here is I know my amplitude is 0 0.0127, so I've already got that number. And then the period is just 1 over the frequency, right? So my period would be 1 over 2.55, and therefore my period for this motion would be uh, 0 0.392 seconds. So there's my period. Now it's just a matter of plugging that all in. So my maximum velocity equals 2 pi times my amplitude of 0 0.0127 meters all over 0 0.392 seconds. So calculating my maximum velocity, I then find that to be about 0 0.204, 0 0.204 meters per second. So there's my maximum velocity. Okay, so again, making sure we're pretty comfortable working through and solving for uh, the maximum speed. That's one of the trickiest questions I'll ask, but we do need to be comfortable with this relationship right here. I'll go ahead and stop this part on, so question 8, part A here, and then I'll pick up part 2 with question 8, part B. So I'll go ahead and pause this here since I'm running short on time.